Our scripture reading today comes from <laughs> the Gospel of Luke. Right. This isn't a misprint. That's we're, right. We're back to the Gospel right. of Luke. Luke yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Uh, anyway, it's Luke 1, verses 26 through 38. I do invite you to hear the word with open ears and open mind and an open heart. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your room and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great. And he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign in the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who has been said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Uh, well, I can't think of a better day for this for today's message, amen? I mean, the, the sermon title is called Giving Up on Perfect, and the subtitle or the thesis is In the Midst of the Mess, God Still Shows Up, amen? Amen. In the Midst of the Mess, God Still Shows Up. And, uh, of course, our Advent and Christmas series are based on a, a little book by uh, Reverend Mike Slaughter called Christmas is Not Your Birthday. And... Um, and Mike is the pastor at Ginghamsburg United Methodist Church in, in uh, just outside of Dayton, Ohio. And he really encourages us this year to make Christmas less about ourselves and more about Jesus. And I've had a, a couple of folks ask me some questions or say some funny things like, you know, they would kind of hang their heads and act guilty when they were talking about getting their Christmas presents for their children this year. And I, I think it's important to remember that e even for Mike, it's a matter of balance. It's a matter of balance. Christmas in our, in our culture has become so tilted to one side. It's, it's become mostly about us, and it's just a way of trying to rebalance the scales and remind ourselves that, um, that Jesus is really Jesus, Christmas is really Jesus' birthday. And if we're going to be about what he was about and honor his birth, then we need to be at least as much about giving to others and sharing with others as we are about receiving for ourselves. And, that said, you know, I, Michelle and I are giving Christmas presents to our godsons and, and our friends and family this year, uh, and I hope to get a few things as well. Amen? I hope Santa Claus comes and sees me. What about you, Pete? I'll get this cold. Yeah, I know. Cold and switches. None of the cold and switches for Pete this year. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it, it's, really, it's, it's really about balance. Uh, about balance. And uh, as I said earlier, next Sunday we'll have our, our Christmas musicals and um, the theme is Scandalous Love and the devotionals in our Traveler's Companion go along with that theme. And we encourage you to make those a part of your daily practices of prayer and Bible study this week. Let's pray. God, we do thank you for all of your blessings, uh, especially for the gift of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And this morning we thank you for being with us uh, by filling us in this place with your presence and with your love and your power and your grace. And now we pray that you will give us your spirit. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, you who are our strength and our friend, our rock and our redeemer. And the people of God said, amen. I love that movie. Um, <laughs> because... You know, Clark wants to have the perfect Christmas, and so he goes out to get the perfect Christmas tree, and then they finally get there for dinner, and they have this horrible turkey, and then they start trying to eat that turkey, and remember, it's all crunchy and chewy and stuff. But uh, I, had, I had a Clark Griswold moment 
Friday night. And uh, Michelle and I are, are so busy during this Christmas season that, uh, that we just have to set up the tree and decorate the house whenever we get a chance. And an ice storm was a pretty good chance to, uh, for us to do that. And, and we have a little ritual that we go through every year. We've done this for, for years and years and years. I, I set up the tree. A couple of years ago, we bought this lovely pre-lit tree. And uh, uh, it, it's in three pieces. Take the three pieces, put the first one in the stand, put the second one on, third one, done, right? You fluff it out a little bit, plug it in, there's the lights, e easy peasy. Boom. And then we put on How the Grinch Stole Christmas on the DVD player. And we start watching How the Grinch Stole, Stole Christmas. And, and we know it heart by, we know it every line, heart by, or, or by heart. Every song, every word. By the end of the Grinch, we're about halfway through decorating the tree. And, and uh, so then it's time to pop in a Charlie Brown Christmas. And so we pop Charlie Brown Christmas in the DVD. And, and by the time the kids stand around and sing, oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, uh, we have our tree decorated. And it's completely finished. We've done this for years. It's very well rehearsed. We got this process down. 40 minutes tops. Perfect. Perfect. So Friday night, I go upstairs in the attic, and I, and I get the tree three pieces. I, I get them together, I, I plug everything in, and most of the lights <laughs> came on. Michelle says, hey, some of the lights aren't on. What's going on? And, and so I'm, I'm cool with that at, at first. I mean, we have some spare bulbs that, that came with the tree, right? And so I go up in the attic, I get the little package of spare bulbs, and I come back down, and I, I start trying to identify the, the uh, offensive bulb. And have you ever tried to fly, find a blown Christmas light on a pre-lit tree? I mean, it, it, it's literally trying to find a needle in a haystack. And so 10 minutes in, I, I'm starting to lose my mind. And I, in my head, I'm like Ralphie in the Christmas store. You know, I'm not saying fudge. <laughs> uh, and so I start crabbing at Michelle, and my Christmas spirit is, is just blown. And, and then, then I found it. And it wasn't a ball. It wasn't a bulb. It was a loose wire. <laughs> ah! Nothing a little solder wouldn't fix, as if I had any solder in the house. And the tree's less than three years old. I mean, isn't the thing still under warranty? And so we, we get the little instruction sheet out, which Michelle, you know, protects, you know, with her, with her mic. And, and I, we start reading about the warranty and what do you do to get a tree fixed if, it, if something like this happens. And, and what does it say? It says you have to ship it. Ship it? Ship it where? And are you kidding me? How long is that going to take? We're not going to have a Christmas tree this year. And, and by this time, all the Who's down in Whoville are blowing their flu-fluvers and whamming their who wonkas and my heart has shrunk three sizes that day. And so I slunk down into my chair and I sipped on my hot chocolate. So what does your perfect Christmas look like? What does your perfect Christmas look like? You know, in the grand scheme of things, a broken wire on a Christmas tree is not that big, big a deal, is it? They make a nice bonfire. <laughs> they, they do make a nice bonfire. Um, but some folks in our church family are really going through some tough things. And, and I, I think about just this past week, I mean, our friend Mark Green died, 57 years old. One day in July... Mark is absolutely fine. Within a week, he's diagnosed with brain cancer, has a brain surgery, and then he doesn't live to see Christmas. Or, or I think about Joe's roller, roller coaster ride this week with his illness and Nancy Wilson's biopsy showing cancer, showing that she has cancer. You know, some of us are dealing with our first Christmas without some, someone we love. Some of us are dealing with traumas in our families. And I think, you know, we think it's messy outside. What's going on within the life of our church family? And sometimes we forget just exactly how messy the first Christmas was. Because as Mike Slaughter says in his book, our ideas about the perfect Christmas are shaped by a highly sanitized view of the original Christmas story. Uh, Christmas it, it was not a very clean and perfect process. The first Christmas was not all shiny and glittery and tinselly. 
And, and we kind of have this image, as I said last week, of, of tiny baby infant Jesus in his golden fleece diapers and his tiny balled up fists, all cute and precious. But the way that Luke tells the story, Jesus' birth was brutal. It was anything but sanitary. Jesus was born in a barn with barnyard animals and barnyard st stuff. Stuff. My, uh, my third grade teacher, Mrs. Johnson, who was also a United Methodist, uh, used to call it, called it manure, manure. And, and she would kind of whisper the word manure when we were reading Charlotte's Web in the third grade. And, uh, you know, I, I've been around a little bit of manure and it stinks and draw fly, draws flies. I mean, it, it's gross. And some of you all know better than I do that childbirth is a messy process as well. Amen? Amen. And then you look at Mary. Then you look at Mary. In, in our scripture reading today, Luke says the angel Gabriel comes to this young lady. She's probably no more than 14 years old, perhaps as young as 12. And, and Luke tells us immediately she was what we would call a good girl, right? I mean, she was, uh, she was not intimate with anyone. She was waiting until she got married to do that. But what does Gabriel tell her? Well, the first thing he does is he calls her favored one. Favored one, right? And, and most of us probably think that sounds pretty good, but when I read it, I, I'm like, you better watch out, Mary. Because Moses was favored by God, and, and everybody that he led, the entire people of Israel, complained about everything, every decision he ever made. David was favored by God, and, and, and we could just say that his family life was a mess, amen? And and not just what you're thinking off the top of your head. The book of Revelation at the end of the Bible says, favored are, are the dead who die in the Lord. Being favored in the Bible is not always a very pleasant experience. The apostle Paul met the risen Christ himself on the road to Damascus. I mean, what could be a sign of God's favor more than that? How much more favor could you be? But listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, I've been beaten more times than I can count. I faced death many times. I, I received the 40 lashes minus one. If you've seen the passion of the Christ, that's the beating that Jesus receives in that movie. He says, I received the 40 lashes minus one five times. I was beaten with rods three times. I was uh, stoned, pelted with stones once. I was shipwrecked three times. I spent a day and a night on the open sea. I faced dangers from rivers, robbers, my people, and Gentiles. I faced dangers in the city, in the desert, on the sea, and from false brothers and sisters. I faced these dangers with hard work and heavy labor, through many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, and in the cold without enough clothes. I mean, does that sound like somebody who's favored by God to you? Well, Gabriel calls Mary favored, and then he tells her the news. We say it's good news, but she didn't know that. She was going to have a baby. Now, now, we know, because we are so familiar with this story, that Mary accepts that responsibility eventually, but you know the first thing she says? How? How can this be happening to me since I'm not intimate with a man? I mean, that's a very human response, isn't it? How can this be happening to me? You know, that's what we say when our life gets messy. That's what we say when we've been doing everything right in our lives and wrong shows up. I mean, how can I lose my job when I've worked so hard? How can I, I get sick when I've taken such good care of myself? How can she not love me when I love her so much? And who can blame Mary for, for saying that? I mean, many women died in childbirth. She was engaged, and in her culture, her fiancé had the right to execute her publicly. How can this be happening to me? And, and then think about Joseph. I mean, Matthew says that like Mary was a good girl. Joseph was a good man. He was righteous. He was good. And now his fiance shows up pregnant. And an angel spoke to him too. Do you remember the first thing the angel says to Joseph in Matthew's gospel? Don't be afraid. Now, why would the angel say that to Joseph? Because he was afraid, amen? 
There was reason for him to be afraid. I mean, what would people think? What were they going to say? <laughs> Holy Spirit, yeah, right. What were they going to say about his boy when he was growing up? What were they going to say behind his back? I mean, Jesus, I mean, excuse me, Joseph must have wondered, how? How can this be happening to me? But this is the story of Jesus, the son of God's birth. And it wasn't perfect and pretty and nice. It was messy. And so the gospel writers, each in their own way, are telling us that in the midst of the mess 2,000 years ago, God showed up. And the good news today is that in the midst of the mess of your life and my life, God still shows up. Amen? Amen. So what do we do in the midst of the mess. Well, there, there are a couple of things in our scripture reading this morning. The first thing is that Mary found comfort and support from an older relative named Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth's pregnancy was a miracle in and of itself, but in a different way. Unlike Mary, she had tried to get pregnant with her husband, Zechariah, but she couldn't. And then through the power of God, she did. And she was about six months ahead of where Mary was in that process. And so when we find ourselves in the midst of, of a mess, we need to remember that we need to look for support and encouragement from people who have been there. Amen? You know, if I was diagnosed with a terminal cancer, who do you, terminal cancer, terminal, other terminal illness, the first person I would call outside of my family would be who? Would be Joe Ogden. Amen. That's right. Or if, God forbid, Michelle and I were going through a divorce, I would go to my friends who have been through that before. And I would lean on them for support and encouragement. And eventually, I would begin to help others who were going through that after me. And that brings us to the second thing. And that is that God can turn our mess into a ministry. Let's say that together. God can turn our mess into a ministry. We serve faithfully. That's what happens when we serve faithfully. When Gabriel finished telling Mary the news, she says, I'm the Lord's servant. Let it be with me just as you have said. And, and what a testimony that is to Mary's faith in God. She chose to serve God in the midst of her mess rather than fall into despair. And you and I can do that too. Now, I, I can't think of anyone who did that better than Nelson Mandela. Amen? I mean, I think of, about what that man went through 27 years in prison. He did nothing but break rocks on Robben Island for 18 years when he was in prison. His mother died while he was in prison. They wouldn't let him go to the funeral. His beloved firstborn child died while he was in prison. They refused to let him go to the funeral. And, and the experiences that he had in, in prison in those, during those 27 years would make most of our hearts hard and bitter, wouldn't they? But for him, they seem to have made his heart simply softer and sweeter. And what he discovered in prison was that the most important battle we fight in life is not outside of us, it's inside of us. The most important battle that we fight is a battle of the soul and of the heart and of the mind. It's the battle of learning to forgive ourselves and others. It's the battle of, of learning to reconcile with one's enemy and to work with them. You see, in the midst of his mess, Mandela learned how to speak the language of his enemies and he began to ask questions and try to understand their concerns and what they were so worried about, what they were so afraid of. And then when he was elected, you may remember that he invited his former jailer, a white man, to come and sit with him at his inauguration. Mandela took the prosecutor who put him to, into prison out to lunch. And he invited, isn't that crazy? And he invited a whole bunch of his former enemies to be a part of his new government in South Africa. And it's not that Mandela was perfect. I mean, don't get that idea. His life was very messy personally and politically. Amen? And things have not been easy in South Africa since the fall of apartheid, but I can't imagine how much worse they would have been had there not been a Nelson Mandela. Amen? 
So I ask you, is your life messy this Christmas? Are you finding it difficult to get into the Christmas spirit? Well, remember, it's not your birthday. It's Jesus' birthday. And he came not into a winter wonderland, but into a real world with real people who have real problems. He came into a messy world of suffering and poverty and homelessness, a world of broken families, a world of persons who are broken spiritually, emotionally, and physically. And he showed, did that to show us that in the midst of the mess, God showed up, and God still does. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and the people of God said, Amen.